Hello, and welcome to Trust Accounts by the Book. I'm Christine Bilbrey. I'm a Senior Practice Management Advisor at Legal Fuel, the Practice Resource Center of the Florida Bar. And I'm Elizabeth Tarbert, Ethics Counsel for the Florida Bar. There are a few key concepts in dealing with trust accounting before we get into the nuts and bolts of how to do it. The first concept is you're a fiduciary. The second is your money has to be kept separate from the client's money. Any money entrusted to you by a client or third party has to be kept separate from your own money. That's called commingling. Finally, tasks can be delegated. So you can have non-lawyer assistants or an accountant handle some of the actual tasks of trust accounting, but the responsibility always stays with the lawyer. So you are always responsible for what happens. A fiduciary is a person or organization that owes to someone else the duties of good faith and trust. All lawyers are fiduciaries with regard to their clients, and when they accept money from clients or third parties in connection with representation, they're fiduciaries to that money. So it is the highest legal duty of one party to another, and it means that you are required to act ethically to protect the interests of that other person. And in this case, when you're dealing with trust accounting, you are obligated to act in the other, either the client or third party's best interests when dealing with their money or their other property. So a lawyer can delegate specific tasks. So a, a non-lawyer can be a signatory on a trust account, as we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, you may have a bookkeeper who handles a lot of the tasks, such as the um, reconciliations that have to be done. Um, a lot of lawyers hire accountants to actually audit their trust account so that they have a third party looking at what they're doing to make sure they're doing it correctly. However, again, the ultimate responsibility remains with the lawyer. The bar does not discipline your non-lawyer assistants or your accountant. So commingling, the third main concept in dealing with trust accounting is prohibited. So a lawyer has to hold in trust under the rules any funds or any property that belong to a client or a third party that the lawyer takes in connection with representation. The lawyer has to hold those things separate from the lawyer's own property. When you're talking about money, that means it has to be held in a separate trust account. So all funds that do not belong to the lawyer are kept in a separate trust account. So that can include advances for fees, advances for costs, and other expenses related to the litigation. Anything that is not earned on receipt has to be held in trust. So there's two main types of trust accounts. Um, the first one is the interest on trust accounts, and that is what, uh, if it's short-term, um, we're going to go into more detail about this. It's short-term, and it's, it's just a small amount. It's got to go into the IOTA trust account. Um, Non-IOTA accounts um, are actually where it's the interest is going to be earned on behalf of the client. So the first one is the one that you're probably most familiar with. Um, the interest that's earned is automatically transmitted by your financial institution to the Florida Bar Foundation. So that money goes uh, to help um, for legal services um, and, and different things that the Bar Foundation uh, uses that for. Um, the rule has changed about financial institutions, so you now can use a credit union. Elizabeth, when did that go into effect? I think it was like February 1st. Yeah, February 1st of 2018. Mm -hmm. So that was a big change. So uh, the eligible institutions, whether it's a bank or a uh, credit union, will calculate and remit the interest on your all your client trust funds. Send that quarterly. You don't have to keep track of the interest that's being earned. It's just going to come and go. That's not part of your reconciliation. Um, and like I said, the Florida Bar Foundation will use these funds to promote their access to justice and help address the civil legal, legal needs of the poor. Non-IOTA trust accounts are typically opened uh, for an individual client because it's going to be a large amount of funds or the attorney is going to be holding it for a longer period of time. Um, and that is when you want the interest to accrue for the benefit of the client. Just a little note, there is actually a rule that says a lawyer cannot earn interest on trust accounts. And that's, again, because you're a fiduciary. You're not allowed to make money off of a client or third party's money. So when you're getting ready to open a trust account for the first time, uh, you really have to make sure that you're using the correct title. The words trust account have to be in the title. So typically it's going to be the name of your law firm, Smith and Jones trust account. Um, some people have IOTA tucked on that. That's, that's not a replacement for the words trust account. 
also do not put the Florida Bar Foundation's name in the title of your trust account. Sometimes financial institutions, uh, you set it up correctly and then you get your checks and it turns out they've, they've changed it. And so if you call us, we're going to say, yes, you do need to get that corrected uh, because those checks are going to go out and they do have to be titled correctly. You can never have overdraft protection on your trust account. Don't link it to your operating account. Um, don't have an ATM card. You can't go and take cash out of that trust account. Um, and then the thing that is very important, there's a letter that the attorney is going to sign and give to the financial institution um, that tells the bank that any time that the account has become overdrawn or that a check is returned, uh, if it's not bank error, they do have to notify us. Um, and a good thing to do is if that happens is to go ahead and turn yourself in. Um, it'll be noted uh, that, that you took care of that if it was a mistake. Um, and I believe you call ACAP to do that. Yes, or you can email ACAP Trust at floridabar.org. So there's three main forms that you need when you're going to go down to the bank and open a trust account. Um, those are all available at our website, legalfuel.com. The first one is the Notice to Bar Foundation form. This alerts the Florida Bar Foundation that you have opened this account. Um, you need to print these out and take them with you because there's information you're going to get from the bank that will go on those forms. The Notice to Eligible Institution, uh, lets the bank know what the requirements are. And then the trust account bank notification letter is what I just talked about, uh, instructing the bank that they must notify uh, the, the Florida Bar if there has been an overdraft or a return check. So there are official forms. You'll find these on our site. You can also go to the Florida Bar Foundation website and find these. Um, so this is the, um, the one that goes to the eligible institution. And then this is a template for a letter, so you'll need to put your own firm name, customize this, and sign it and take it to uh, the bank with you. So when you open a trust account, uh, we get a lot of questions about this. Uh, the rule um, just talks about having um, a small amount. Uh, typically, and it's not in the rule, but typically most attorneys are going to open that with $200 or so. And it's really just to cover in case the bank takes a fee out of your trust account. You don't want to have an overdraft um, or a return check uh, because the bank inadvertently took something out, a fee-related thing out of your trust account. Um, so you do, you can maintain funds. This isn't considered commingling. It's the only time that, that you can have a little bit of money in the account and you do maintain that. An important thing to do is to have a client ledger card that's actually for your firm. Otherwise, a lot of times people can't reconcile their account because they forgot that they have that little bit of money in the account. So one tip to help you distinguish between your operating account and your trust account is to have the checks be a different color. So say have your trust account checks be green and your operating account checks be red. This means that you will not inadvertently use an uh, operating account check instead of a trust account or vice versa. The vice versa is the one that's going to get you into more trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something that that's very clear because just because you accidentally shoved the wrong check in the printer, it's it's still going to come out of the the wrong account. Um, there's also uh, high security checks that decrease the odds of becoming a victim. It's like um, the the old checks, even if it was an in ink, they could basically wash them and take off and have you know change the payee on them. Uh, so look into that when you're ordering your checks. So there is a relatively new rule that uh, went into effect in 2014 that requires all law firms who have trust accounts to have a written trust account plan. So anybody who has more than one attorney has to have a written plan in place for each of the firm's trust accounts. So a firm might have an IOTA trust account and a separate interest bearing account with sub accounts for individual clients where the interest is accruing to the benefit of those clients. So you would have to have a separate written plan for each of those accounts. The written plan has to include the names of all people who ha are signatories on the trust account. So as we've said before, you can have a non-lawyer who is a trusted non-lawyer be a signatory on your trust account. Um, but anybody who has a signatory authority in your trust account, anybody who can sign checks for your trust account has to be listed on the plan. Um, anybody who is responsible for re reviewing trust accounts um, or responsible for overseeing the reconciliation on a monthly and annual basis of the firm's trust accounts, those people have to be listed as well. And these forms, again, are available on legalfuel.com in our document library and in this section under trust accounting. 
So again, a firm manager, again, it has to be somebody who's a trusted employee um, or a CPA can be authorized to sign trust account checks, but the lawyer is responsible for making sure they oversee that person's tasks that they perform. It's often a good idea to insure them and even bond the non-lawyer that you are authorizing to sign on your trust account. Um, that person's name and title would be written in the plan along with the name of the partner who's responsible for overseeing that, that signatory. Oh, and a frequently asked question on this topic. After you um, draft the trust accounting plan and sign it, it's something that you maintain with your trust accounting records at your firm. Don't mail it into us. Another thing to re remember is you need to update the per plan periodically. If you change signatories, that plan has to be changed to reflect accurately who the current signatories are. So we'll talk about a little bit about some of the kinds of things that get deposited into your trust account. Um, first of all, non-refundable flat fees. Non-refundable flat fees are often charged in cases like immigration or criminal defense, and they are earned on receipt. You do, then deposit them into your operating account, not your trust account, unless the client writes you a check that represents both a non-refundable fee plus costs that are to, to be expended in the case. In that case, you would deposit the entire check into your trust account, and then within a reasonable time, remove the portion that represents your non-refundable and therefore earned fee. That is, it's yours the minute you get it. It doesn't belong to the client anymore. Now, in order for a non-refundable fee to be a non-refundable fee, you have to designate it as such in order for that to be true. Um, you also have to do that in writing. So you have to either have a written agreement with the client that both you and the client sign, or you have to confirm to the client in writing after you've discussed with the client the fact that you're going to charge a non-refundable flat fee so that there's documentation that that's what the fee is intended to be. So again, those go into operating not trust. Retainers. Retainers are often an often misunderstood term. A lot of people use the term retainer to be interchangeable with an advance fee. They are not the same thing. A true retainer is a, an amount of money that's given to a lawyer to guarantee their availability to a particular client. So they're not funds against which future services are billed. Um, they're paid to guarantee the lawyer will be available if the client needs the lawyer's legal services. They are like the non-refundable flat fee earned on receipt. So again, with those, you put them into your operating account. And again, unless they're given to you, say, with an advance on costs, in which case you put the entire check into trust and remove the part that represents your retainer, which is yours. The third kind of fee that often is charged is advance on fees and costs. So advances are fees against which you're, it's an amount of money against which you're going to bill, usually on an hourly basis. So they're the property of the client because you haven't earned them yet. That has to be placed into trust and you bill against it and take fees out on a, within a reasonable period of time after you've earned them. So they're held separate from your money. So as Christine said earlier, IOTA is only short-term or nominal funds. So you have to determine what's nominal or short-term. So if you have funds that are either such a small amount of money or going to be held by you for such a short period of time that they really cannot generate beneficial interest for the third person or the client that you're holding it for, then we're going to, that's IOTA, that's nominal or short-term. So Basically, the cost of administering, figuring out how much the interest is going to be is more than the, than the interest is going to be. So the, the way that's handled is those are aggregated all together, not only the funds that you're holding on behalf of all these third parties, but also other funds from lawyers um, who are also holding them in an IOTA account. Those all get aggregated together. They actually can generate interest under those circumstances, and that interest is sent to the foundation. So um, it, it's actually important to remember when you're dealing with that, that you, the lawyer, have to make that determination in good faith as to whether it's short-term or nominal. Do not have your client sign something saying they agree that they are short-term or nominal or that you're going to treat them as short-term or nominal or the client agrees that they will be placed in trust. Um, the reason for that is it creates a tax liability for the client. If the client is the one who controls the money, then the IRS will tax them. So you, the lawyer, have to make the determination that it's nominal or short-term. It takes the client's um, 
autonomy out of that situation and they are not going to get taxed on it. So you make that ju judgment and you just do it in good faith. Um, disbursement against uncollected funds. Lawyers are not permitted to disperse funds that are held in a trust account until the funds are actually collected. Collected means they've been deposited, settled, and actually credited and released to the lawyer's account. Sometimes uh, you will look at your bank accounts and see that the funds are listed as being available. That does not necessarily mean that they are actually collected. That means the bank is looking at your account and sometimes they're looking at all of the accounts you're holding in a single institution and deciding, okay, if you write against those funds, you have enough funds in all of your aggregated accounts to cover it. So they will say the funds are available even when they haven't been collected. So you need to make sure that the funds are collected funds before you disperse unless one of the exceptions apply. So what are those exceptions? There are certain types of deposits from different institutions that carry a very limited risk that they're not going to actually be collected. So under those circumstances, you're allowed to disperse against uncollected funds. So for example, if you have a certified check or a cashier's check that you're depositing into your trust account, or it's loan proceeds issued by a federally or state chartered bank, then you have a bank check, an official check, a treasurer's check, a money order, a check that's written against a uh, licensed Florida bar member's um, trust account or a real estate broker's trust account, a check that's been issued by the United States, the state of Florida, or any kind of agency of the state of Florida, or a check that's issued by an insurance company, title insurance company, or licensed title insurance agency authorized to do business in the state of Florida. These are all things that the bar the, and the court really thinks are minimal risks. They're going to be collected at some point. There is a very small chance that those funds will be subject to say a stop order or something. So you can disperse against uncollected funds and under those limited circumstances. The important thing to remember though, if you are dispersing against uncollected funds, you're responsible for those funds. So even though it's permissible, many lawyers choose not to disperse against funds until they are collected because it's A, not required, and B, at your own risk. If for some reason those funds never become collected, it's the lawyer's responsibility to make up the difference. All right, if you disperse against uncollected funds in any situation other than the exceptions that we just talked about, that can be a grounds for finding of professional misconduct. So it's, a, it's grounds for discipline. And the reason for that is you're going to rob pay, Peter to pay Paul. Other clients' funds are going to be used to cover the funds that, are, that you're dispersing against. So you're actually um, misappropriating another client's funds when you do that. Even if the check isn't returned because you had those other clients' uh, monies in the account. So trust account shortages, what do you do if there is ever a shortage in your trust account? Well, you hope that never happens to you, but the reality is there are lots of times um, where there is a theft from a trust account, um, either because a lawyer in the firm who's a signatory on the account steals funds, or sometimes a trusted non-lawyer employee who's a signatory on the account steals funds. Additionally, there are sometimes just a shortage because maybe you had a bank um, a, a bank error that occurs. Um, the bank paid out too much on the check, for example, because it misread the check. So if you have a situation where you have a shortage in your trust account, it's the lawyer's obligation to act immediately to protect the funds of the other clients. Depending on the circumstances, you may even have to shut down a trust account and move the funds to a new trust account, just it, particularly in a situation where there's been a theft and particularly in a situation um, where there has been some kind of scam where you don't even know who the third party is who had access to those funds. So if, if the lawyer does what the lawyers should do and, and makes up that shortage in their trust account, um, they're not going to be considered guilty of professional misconduct. However, if the lawyer makes up that shortage, the lawyer does have to notify the bar so the bar knows there was a shortage in the lawyer's trust account. And again, you'll have the opportunity to explain that to the Florida bar. And this actually happened at a firm that I was at. They did workers' compensation claims and a grocery store chain had paid out the settlements that were agreed to, deposited, collected. And then that particular grocery store chain filed for bankruptcy. And when the bankruptcy... Um, officer came in, they stopped payment on all the checks. And so we were scrambling to, to replace the funds through no fault of the attorneys. 
So again, a lawyer is allowed to deposit their own funds into trust to replenish a shortage in the trust account, either because of a theft or a bank error. Um, it can't be more than what is required to make up that shortage. And again, the lawyer has to immediately notify the Florida Bar's Lawyer Regulation Department at um, that the name of their trust account, the cause of the shortage, and the amount of the replenishment. And that can all be sent to ACAPTrust at floridabar.org. One of the things we get a lot of questions about is monthly reconciliation. This is a requirement under the rules, and this means every single month that you are going to do what we call a three-way three reconciliation. And so that involves the trust account journal, which is basically the checkbook register of the entire trust account, the monthly bank statement from your financial institution, and then a total of all the client ledger cards, meaning that every client you have that has money in your account needs to have an individual ledger card so that's like the checkbook register of that client's matter. Um, so if you, we have forms on legalfuel.com. And so each month you need to reconcile these three. So that means, um, and you'll see this on the form, that any uh, checks that you've written, but the bank doesn't know about them, you're going to have to write in. Or if you have made a deposit, but it hasn't been credited on that month's bank statement, you've got to add that in. And that would cause it to balance if you, if you note those two differences. A lot of lawyers ask why we have so many requirements that seem very technical. Um, they really do actually do make sense. The reason you have a trust account ledger, which is basically your checkbook, is you have to be able to know what the balance is in your trust account at any given moment because you do not want to have an overdraft. Um, the reason why you have separate individual ledger cards is, again, because you're a fiduciary, you have an obligation to be able to notify your clients at any time or upon their request exactly how much of their money you are holding for them. And this is one of the things that comes up with um, the file retention rules. So um, all these trust account records have to be maintained for a minimum of six years from the close of a matter. Um, so don't forget to print, print out those ledger cards and keep those too with the file. So this is an example. If you don't have trust accounting software, so if you're not doing this on your computer, you can actually download these Excel forms on LegalField.com um, and save them. And you can this this will meet the requirements, but you do have to do this every month. Um, and if if you fill in, it's all pre-programmed for you. So if you add in the amounts from your bank statement and your client ledger cards are already in there, um, you're going to be able to balance this each month. I recommend that you actually after you reconcile it each month that you print out the reconciliation form and date it and sign it so you have that proof on hand um, that you've done that. If you let it, I think, you know, attorneys are very busy. They'll, a few months will go by and they'll realize they haven't done this. Stay on top of this. If it just becomes a habit, it'll only take a few minutes each month. Um, and so you are required to maintain this record that you have reconciled your account. So I mentioned that you do have to uh, retain these records. Um, and so when you are operating a trust account, there are some documents that you have to keep. And you, you can, after you have these documents, it's perfectly fine to scan them in. You can maintain them digitally, but you need the deposit slips. And the deposit slip should show uh, the date, the amount of the deposit, and where it's coming from and which client matter it goes to. So you're going to actually, the bank typically will give you these, the old ones were carbon and you would fill out if you're depositing multiple checks, you'd write on every matter. Um, you have to have the canceled checks for all uh, trust checks that you've written and it must be the front and the back of the check. Um, a lot of banks were only sending in that bank statement, they would send you uh, a picture of the front of all of your checks. And so you need to, if your bank isn't aware of it, let them know that it is a rule requirement that they also maintain the back because we have to see who actually endorsed the check. Um, Oops, skipped ahead there. Uh, you need detailed records of all electronic transfers. So if you are banking online and you've billed a client and so you're now permitted to move uh, the fee that you've earned from the trust account to the operating account and you do it online, you still have to create a paper trail of all the details of that electronic transfer just as if it was a paper check. 
Um, if you go into the rules, there's going to be detailed uh, requirements for what goes into a wire transfer. I think it's like who initiated it when it happened, a lot of detail for that. Uh, you need the cash receipts and disbursements journal and then the ledger card or page for each client and the bank statement. So if you're just checking your account online real quick, go ahead and save that bank statement as a PDF if you're doing digital files or print that out and staple it to that form uh, that shows that you reconciled your account that month. Um, the rule states that a law firm or attorney must maintain their trust account records, as I mentioned, for at least six years from the final conclusion um, of representation of that matter. If you, your firm dissolves um, and you are actually going to another firm um, or you were a solo and you're joining a big firm, you do have to still maintain those records. If you sell your firm, um, the law firm or the partners have to make reasonable arrangements for the maintenance and retention of those client trust account records, just like they would the, the actual um, matter files. So if you sell it, uh, that's mentioned in the rule too. make make arrangements how the buyer is going to maintain those records, because if a client comes looking for you years later, you need to, they need to be able to find out where their information is. So unfortunately, this happens a lot. Um, you're, you've been reconciling your account, you think you're on top of everything, and then you find that you wrote a check a few months ago and that client never cashed it. Now you can't find that client. Um, you've tried to contact them for a period of time and that amount is just sitting there in your trust account. Um, so there is a rule about that. It's in Florida statutes and uh, we have instructions from the Florida Bar. So you are required to state that uh, the funds are designated on the trust account record as being held for a missing owner. So you would actually um, put that on the client ledger card, however you're maintaining those records. Uh, you have to have made a diligent attempt to contact the client. So you go back through the file, any addresses you had, do, do a search and really try to get that money to the client. That's the best thing. Um, but if you have done that and you still can't locate the client, you are going to have to turn those funds over to the state of Florida. And that's when the Florida statutes enters into this. So the unclaimed forms are reported to the Florida Department of Financial Services. And if you come to our website or you can email us, we can send you, there's just a little quick handbook of how you go online, you register yourself and you turn those uh, funds over to uh, the state of Florida. And so this is their telephone number. The website is that Florida treasure hunt. A lot of people go on there looking to see if somebody left them money that they don't know about, but it's also uh, the same website if you need to turn over unclaimed funds. Often it's not that you can't find the person. Sometimes it's the firm can't figure out who the money belongs to. You follow the mm -hmm. same exact procedure under those circumstances. Yeah. And sometimes it's little amounts. And so someone will call us and say, well, I've got $10 on this one and $5 for this one. If you can't return those, um, the state of Florida lets you bundle that together because I think there's a little bit of fee of a fee to turn it over. So to make it worth your while, you can bundle them. Um, the trust account certificate, uh, we get a lot of questions about this because I think people, when they hear the monthly reconciliation, they think they're supposed to be filing something with the bar every month and that's not the case. Uh, the trust account certificate is actually on your annual fee statement. It's just a section of the fee statement where you are certifying whether you have complied with the trust accounting rules. Um, if you don't comply, I think there's a box you check and that triggers something else. Um, but I think there's three choices. But this is, this is just something you're going to find on your annual fee statement. And if you're paying online, you will not be allowed to pay your fees until you've certified whether or not you're in compliance with the trust accounting rules. And remember, you can certify that you're in compliance with trust accounting rules if you don't have a trust account because you never accept money from clients or third parties in connection with representation. Mm -hmm. Or you're a state attorney or a judge, you still have to respond to the question, even if you don't have a trust account. Okay, so now say you're a solo, you're joining that big firm, or you're retiring, or you know what we talked about before, sometimes you're gonna have to shut a trust account down if there's been fraud. Um, so there is a process for that. We also have a form, a lovely form on legalfield.com. Um, but this is the information that you've gotta to get to the Florida Bar Foundation. You go ahead and you balance the account, you know, reconcile it, shut it. After it is closed, you are going to let the Florida Bar Foundation know this is the account number, the financial institution, the name it was held under. They need to know the date that you closed it. 
um, the Dayton address of lawyer firm and you send it to the Florida Bar Foundation, which is outside the Florida Bar, don't send it to us. Um, and this is all available on our website and it's, you can, uh, you can call them. Um, I think they're letting you email it better to do the form and have it in writing. And if you have questions, you can call either the Florida Bar's Ethics Hotline at 1-800-235-8619 or uh, the Practice Resource Center at 866-730-2020. We also have live chat. Uh, you can email us. Um, and this is all we do is, is we help with the business side of managing your firm. So please send in all your trust account questions. Thank you for staying with us through the entire CLE. If you would like to get credit for the CLE, you can use the course number 1806863N to self-report the CLE credit.